Washington, D.C. is my home away from home. I've worked here for the better part of three decades as a founder entrepreneur, policy expert, and author. Probably the longest title. Um, everybody sort of shortened it to ONC for sanity. Merci sake. Mercifully. Yeah, mercifully. I've learned leadership secrets from many healthcare executives who understand that Washington is the largest payer and regulator of healthcare. She said, well, because you'll never get a husband if you do that. <laughs> I began interviewing healthcare leaders many years ago because what better way to learn how they think, why they make it to the top, and how they remain there. Think about what was your most challenging engagement? Healthcare has been the most difficult problem. <laughs> Let me just say that. We'll talk about that later. This is part two of an engaging interview with Dr. Karen DeSalvo. In part one, we covered her consideration of ballet as a profession to deciding upon medicine and the joy in leading public health as Commissioner of Health in New Orleans. In this episode, Karen explores her federal government service as Assistant Secretary of Health and National Coordinator for Health Information Technology, where she studied the importance of the High Tech Act in accelerating the digitization of medicine. Karen will share why she accepted the offer to join Google. She reviews the role that Google played during the COVID crisis, which is not generally known. She describes how it drew on her experiences and understanding of public health. We wrap up the conversation with Dr. Karen DeSalvo by discussing her bucket list and the movement toward public health 3.0. Well, what led to going to Washington then? How did that come about? <laughs> the, um... It's all Mitch's fault. No, it's the it's the work that we had done in uh, New Orleans that was um, on the radar of of uh, the the people who were in the administration. Not only work in building pr great primary care that Kathleen Sebelius had had been tracking and knowing about, but our I'd been very involved in a lot of the health information technology work for the state of Louisiana and for New Orleans um, after Katrina. It was a time, you might remember, when there was a lot of money coming out of Washington to support the digitization of the care experience. And I was involved in all three of the grants. I was either on the governing group or the, the um, uh, our organization was, was leading the execution of it or, or um, we were a part of the, the, that was for two of them. And the other one was, so there's a Beacon grant, which was population health, and there was one about the last mile of implementing EHRs, and then there was one about the uh, health information exchange. So I got to know all the ONC people, basically, off the national coordinator. And um, when they needed a new national coordinator, they called and said, we think that you're just what we need because you know how to implement technology in medicine and public health and in community health. Would you come to Washington and be a part of the team? And I said, thank you, no, not at all. I'm not interested in, um, I'm not a technology person. I'm a community and public health person, but but thank you. Um, and, you know, then they called back and <laughs> they said, just come talk to us. And so I did. And then um, I, uh, they said, the secretary wants to talk to you. And I said, I, I, don't, I don't want her to call me because I don't want to have to say no to her. And she she called me on a like a Saturday and it was this Kansas phone number and I thought it was a sales call so I didn't answer it and then when I listened to the voice message it was Kathleen and I was like oh now I gotta call her back and she's so smart she said she said uh, don't say no don't say anything just listen and then she explained like how she was thinking about it's kind of like Mitch you know had this same view of the world she had a view of the world that aligned with mine that it wasn't technology wasn't the end game the end game was equity and health and these things I care a lot about and that she needed she needed that kind of experience on the team so I, um, I, I joined um, and I said yes like a few days before healthcare.gov went south by the way so that was also an interesting <laughs> interesting window um, I wasn't in the administration at the time but I thought oh that doesn't look like they're having fun um, anyway it was it was wonderful and I loved working for her and I loved working for Sylvia who's the secretary that followed uh, different different women with different ways of working and seeing the world and it was wonderful experience to kind of uh, be, in, be in that in that work so yeah it's that reluctant leadership thing I am I'm the worst example of it although it was not like that for Google I can tell you when they called I said when do I show up <laughs> yeah that that's an entirely different opportunity isn't it uh, before we get to that though but but it's kind of related in that um, you know, if you think about the High Tech Act, which fundamentally digitized medical care uh, broadly, I would say, 
And then the ONC position, which really allowed you to see that. How, how important was the High Tech Act, do you think, to medicine in this decade and next decade? And the Google position is kind of right in the middle of all of that, I think. Yeah, it was pretty um, obviously transforming uh, for, for the way that we think about um, health as uh, not just a one-off experience that people have when they're sick and not something that's um, owned and controlled by physicians and healthcare systems, but that has that democratizes that experience for people. Uh, it sounds super lofty, but that's the way I always saw it. I saw it as, yeah, like this is this isn't data that's going to live in a paper chart in the back of someone's office. This is now going to be your data as a consumer that you can share, that you can make uh, that you can make available for efforts like precision medicine, so for science to advance that work that you could make available for public health, that you can make available to other providers, to your family. It, it's it's a it's a really empowering thing for consumers if done properly and and for clinicians. I mean, just as much as as difficult as it was for us. Just even being able to look someone up after when you're on call after hours for your group and know that they were started on a drug that day and that's probably why they're coughing or having this new symptom, it's pretty dramatically life-changing. And that was the first kind of taste, for, certainly for me, uh, when, I, when you're doing group call to be able to have that information, but then there's so much more that, that's expanded. And I think we're only obviously just beginning to understand it. But you know, Gary, you asked me earlier about like words that I think of in leadership and ONC is reminding me of something that has been a hallmark of my career, which is um, turnarounds. And um, I, I think the turn, uh, turnaround slash building, and I love that kind of stuff. And ONC was, was an example of a, of a turnaround where I, and so was the health department in New Orleans and, and, and a lot of my work uh, at, that, at the medical school, that when I arrived at ONC, it was a place where they had gotten really laser focused on meaningful use, which was this government program to, that, for people who don't know, to incentivize um, electronic health records by um, paying basically for their adoption. But the program was um, uh, overreaching um, and, and creating so much friction with doctors and others that it, 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 was, it was causing people to not want to, to move forward with modernization. And the, the team had kind of um, gotten so heavily focused on it, they'd, they'd lost sight of all the other important work that we needed to get done. And, and my, my thing was put down your pencils and let's figure out what are the authorities and responsibilities that we have to the public and who should have the, you know, how should consumers have better access to their data. But when I say turnaround, I also stepped in um, at a time when the high tech money from that act was at the it's cliff. That's yep. right. We got we got infusion of a couple of billion dollars into this tiny little office of 60 people. It had been only about 12 people. It ballooned to 60. It had a lot of contractors, and the budget was ending. And it wasn't really known to the team. It honestly wasn't known to me until I until I it, it, I understood it. And I realized we were going to have to go from being a grant making organization to being a policy making organization in the span of like six months. Thank goodness we had a lot of good policy chops from the original people who had been policy oriented, but it also meant people who were good at giving out multi, you know, million dollar grants needed to work at other parts of the government or somewhere else that did that work because we weren't going to do it anymore. And it was, it was, um, you know, the, the, it was such a, a great experience for me to think about doing that. I'd done it at, at, at the local level. I'd done it at the city level. Doing it at the national level helped me understand some of the the, the, the change management components, but also just like how uh, even uh, uh, how important it is to ask. Maybe it's about asking the right questions to make sure that you're understanding what your remit's going to be when when you step it into the org. I think the other thing about the turnarounds in all of those cases um, also was the turnaround of the trust that the community had in those organizations. Trust was was um, certainly weakened in our health department in New Orleans, um, in ONC, when I arrived at those at those organizations, and it was uh, super important to me that when I walked out the door, that those were trusted organizations because I felt both of them were really important as part of the ecosystem going forward. What would you advise, or you probably already have, uh, Mickey Tripathi, who's the current ONC leader? What what advice would you give to him? 
Yeah, you know, Mickey's terrific, and uh, I think he's just the right person at the right time for this job. And part of that is because Mickey um, understands that the responsibility and the opportunity for the national coordinator is more than just EHRs in the healthcare environment, but that EHRs are a, he understands it's not, it's a source of data, not the source of data. There's this opportunity to tell the story of someone's health by understanding their social context and, and pulling in data, in, in data from not just medical devices, but social determinants and, and, other, and other sources. And he understands that there's multiple use cases, not just healthcare, but public health and, and, and science. It's where, we, it's where we were going. And I think it's not that Don Rucker didn't understand it, but Don definitely um, had more of an interest in, in understanding the, the medical context. I think towards the end began to see that there's a real need uh, for the national coordinator to ensure that they're understanding the, the responsibility that they have to coordinate across government and with the, the private sector for a lot of reasons. Uh, one, one of them is the coordination is about um, giving certainty to the marketplace so that there's a nonpartisan, pragmatic approach to how we're going to digitize not just the healthcare experience, but the health experience of Americans and use that to inform daily health work and, as we've seen in the pandemic, it needs to be able to inform public health and forecast future health challenges. So I, that's what I told Mickey, but he was already there. Um, and I, I, I know that um, he's, he really understands technically as well as um, from a relationship standpoint, the, th the important things that are gonna have to get done uh, going forward, especially in partnership with the CDC. I'm excited about it. And he's got a fabulous team, and Don, Don did too, and Don was really good, but Don Rucker was the last national coordinator. A lot of the, some of the people who work there have been there since the origins of the Office of National Coordinator, and there's some serious talent in that office. Yeah. Well, it's much needed, that's for sure. Yeah. And it's good to hear you uh, kind of express your confidence in the group. Well, thinking about Google, um, which in many ways seems like you're ideally suited for that job, but but what was the opportunity you saw in going to Google? Well, you know, when I um, left government, I had been working at the intersection, to use a kitschy phrase, of public health and technology and medicine. But I literally was doing that because I was national coordinator at the same time that I was assistant secretary for health and was um, co-leading the delivery system reform work. So we were, I was in all of those spaces in any given day, you know, or hour that's of the day. That's in the category, Karen, if I could interrupt, that's in a category of just taking on too much responsibility. <laughs> I <know. laughs> oh, I know. It was. So you may, may be learning, but I don't know. That, you know, in the, in the oh, most definitely. I mean, in, in, the, in the framework of giving advice to yourself, I totally failed at that. <laughs> you know, I was, I was national coordinator and I was in the middle of us finishing that turnaround. We weren't quite done. And um, I hadn't rebuilt the leadership team. Ebola got very hot and there was not an ash. And, and the ash, the assistant secretary for health oversees the Surgeon General and the Public Health Service Commission Corps. And the, uh, is the, the director of, of, of blood safety for the country and has some other roles. Um, and, and so they needed an acting assistant secretary because in particular the Commission Corps was gonna stand up a hospital in West Africa for Ebola, but there were a series of other things that would be happening. And we didn't, we had an acting Surgeon General. So there were, there were some reasons why they needed some additional leadership there. So they said, would you step over? It was literally down the hall. Like the two offices were down the hall from each other. I was like, sure, whatever, it's just down the hall. So, so I, I took that on and um, thinking that I would phase out of being national coordinator, there was, um, um, you know, there, there was a need for me, though, to stay on as national coordinator for a while, and then it became, well, um, we've kind of figured out how to do it, and um, let's just keep going for a bit. And um, I did until uh, Vindel Washington uh, joined, and then he, for the last few months of the administration, was the, the national coordinator. Um, so the, the, we could tell stories all day about that, but, but I'll, I'll tell you a couple of quick things, which is that doing those two, the, the delivery system reform work was, um, another really fantastic effort I do with Patrick Conway, but it became less and less of my time uh, it, than it had been when I first stepped in. So it wasn't as three full-time jobs. It was really towards the end, mostly two. 
But those are two principles roles. So, so I wouldn't have known this before I went into government, but those are two externally facing principles that are expected to do a lot of stakeholder management, um, to, to give a lot of speeches, um, to be out in the country. I had 10 offices as the ash, so I was you know, visiting those as well. And so my calendar was pretty full. <laughs> I, mean, I was really, and, and God bless my team, like my comms team and everyone else. They're like, I'm sorry, which Karen is this? Is this, <laughs> is this that? <laughs> but yes, yeah, so, but what, but, you know, but what happened is that it became so clear to me and everyone else that there's wonderful things about public health that could inform what technology needed to do. This, you know, understanding about, there's some appreciation of population health and ethics and equity. There's also things about technology that needed to be um, in, informing public health. So increasingly bringing those worlds together. And this report that we did, um, Public Health 3.0, is a very crisp example of how those worlds got married for me in, in, a, in a future vision of where the public health infrastructure should go. So, um, yeah, wouldn't do it again necessarily, but I think the output's been good, and it led me to Google, quite honestly. And so when, when they called and said, are you interested in coming here, I, I, I was not being flippant earlier when I said, I said, oh, yes, when do I show up? Because to me, it's, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a place where not only do you have the scale of the world, but you have the world's attention in this really um, uh, promising way where, the, where people... The community wants information. They want knowledge. They want um, they want help. And at, you know whether I was a doctor or a public health person or a public servant, that's what I'd get up in the morning to do. Right? How am I going to help? How am I going to help this person when they have questions? Now it's the world, like asking us on search and maps and YouTube and. So that was sort of one piece as a direct connection to the consumers in this really scaled way. And I've always felt like. We've not figured that out well in health. We talk to doctors and to payers and to health system leaders, but there's not a, a, not a, a true B2C, business to consumer way of, of giving them the information they need at scale to really take the reins of their health. And so that was one really attractive piece. The other is uh, the kind of the, um, we're, we're like missing this chance, I think, in, in this century to leverage AI and sophisticated um, methodologic approaches to augment work of medicine or the doctor or the nurse or public health writ large. And, and it's, it's, just, it's, it's essentially a new way of ingesting complex data of which we're overwhelmed with, right? Of trying to get to, 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 to be horizontal in how we're strategically thinking about improving the health of a person or a community. And it's just, uh, I think we, but when we have to, when we figure it out, we've got to make those models fair and equitable. We've got to think about how they're most useful in a workflow. You can't just throw AI into the clinical environment or the public health environment. And I'll tell you, Gary, we've had this incredible journey the last, you know, whatever, 15 months of the pandemic of learning, right. of, of, of now learning as a company, not only here's all of our tools that we can have, but how can we be useful? And it's just accelerated the conversation with all of those actors that I mentioned, consumers, public health, medicine. So it's, um, yeah, that, I mean, coming here is just work with brilliant people who have amazing talent to do good and we have a reach and people are knocking on our door every day uh, wanting that kind of help. And I mean, how could you say no to that? No, I, I don't think you can. I'm glad you didn't. Uh, it also strikes me that now that you're there, you probably see even more opportunity than you thought when you went there. Is that true? Most definitely. I think um, I, I think I was, you know, when I came, it was it was to be the chief health officer in Google Health, which I still am. It, which is a, um, a group that does research and, and builds products that are for clinicians and consumers uh, broadly to think about how, you, how we can apply AI, AI to give superpowers uh, to both of them. But the pandemic taught me very fast is about all the rest of the company. You know, sort of what are the ways that we can think about YouTube as a, a, a way to mass customize content for high-risk communities in whatever area? What are the ways that we think about leveraging ads in partnership with community-based organizations to help people know what kind of resources are available to them at the local level to get transportation to the food bank? I mean, there's, there's just a, a lot of ways that you can do the, the public health good. I think what I definitely am learning here is the, the, that we have some novel signals that will be useful to medicine and public health and to community health 
and and we're just beginning to exercise those muscles. Um, you know, we we've put out work in, in climate change, for example, that's looked at flooding and, 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 and really important impactors of health. We've been doing this with search data um, that we've made available to academics and to the public health community and to healthcare systems to do some forecasting. So, so I think the novel signals piece, um, I'm just beginning to understand the power of the data inputs. I guess the AI is the you, the, the, the methodology of that data, and then the audience and sort of the, the partnerships and the use um, that we might do. I, 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 I have, I'll be here 10 years and I'll still be trying to figure out all the amazing ways that we can be helpful, but it's, it's a pretty incredible place. What about thinking back when you were Commissioner of Health uh, in New Orleans, I mean, do you see health departments being able to work directly with Google to help the fact that you know a lot of these health departments just aren't well resourced and they really do need help uh, is, is there some connection there that you're thinking about oh we're doing that yeah i mean when i was um the, the expression i always have for when i was health commissioner is that i you know we did it with two nickels and some friends and it, <laughs> it it's not that far off you know and and new orleans health department is small and super under resourced and it's uh, you know, in much better shape because the people there have just done an, an amazing work. We, my team, when I was there, and they've continued that on. So it's in better shape, but it's still incredibly under-resourced and doesn't have, you know, uh, teams that can ingest big big data and analyze it and create data visualization tools. I mean, just as an example, a lot of a lot of the especially local health departments are that way, but some state in in. So as we thought in, during the pandemic about how we could be helpful, um, those are some of the kinds of tools that we have, we've offered. So let me, let me use the search symptoms trends as, as, the, as the example, but uh, I'll give you two. That's the first one I want to use. Because one of the first things that I said to our researchers here when I got here was when I was health commissioner, to get information about the pulse of my community, of what they needed, I could look at very stale epi data that had been collected two years prior, so that was a rear view mirror look. Then I would sit in church halls and community centers and drink stale coffee that we brought, whatever, to talk to community and, and um, figure out what was on their minds. I often say that, that, that what, was, what I learned in the, those first few weeks as health commissioner is that what the data said was people were dying of cardiovascular disease and cancer, and what people told me when I talked to them was that people were dying of violence and lack of economic opportunity. And those things actually do relate to each other. Um, the allostatic load from those, those issues relates to developing cardiovascular disease. There's biologic plausibility there. But I wouldn't have seen that if I hadn't been able to talk to them. So I said to the teams, Can, is there a way to get just cross-sectional data from the search that, tells, that would tell a local health commissioner what their community is thinking about? And that's what search symptoms trends is. That's what they've built. Um, it's much more sophisticated than I could have ever imagined, but it's that idea that can we create an anonymized set of data that would tell a local health officer in the last day, and then comparing to three, the last three years, this is the kinds of things on the top of the mind of your community. So that is a tool available, but we also knew that, that it would need to be, um, we'd need to create the data visualization tools and we'd have to support and help. So we've done that as well. Now, the more concrete way that we've been working uh, locally during the pandemic is, wow, there's so many examples, but I'll, I'll use the exposure notifications as the example. And it, that's definitely more at the state level than local. But we, when we, when, what we heard from local health officers was we need to do contact tracing. We need to scale it. People are not answering their phones when we call them. Can you help us? And so working with Apple, we created this um, digital contact tracing tool that augments uh, augments the work of regular contact tracing, augment being the operative word, it doesn't replace, and uh, longer, lots of story about that, but it's this idea of these brilliant engineers realizing that Bluetooth low energy is a really pretty good way to see who's been within six feet for more than 15 minutes of another, which phone has been close to another phone, and you could use that as an anonymous way to notify people of exposure. So it would protect privacy, it would give information to public health, and it would be a technology that public health would know. In fact, when 
the engineer said, would Bluetooth low energy be an option? I said, I don't even understand what you're talking about. Like, you have to, <laughs> you have to explain this to me. And they said, well, we're just going to build this API. Blah, blah, blah. And I said, okay, well, we're going to have to back up and, and really get the glossary out and make sure everyone understands. We did. I mean, we, we, I don't even, I've lost, I lost count, honestly, Gary, but we talked to dozens and dozens of he local health leaders including at the county and the city level and at the state level and national associations over the course of months to explain to them what we could do, how it could be helpful to get their feedback, to keep iterating. And we've been doing that still of course, the across the pandemic. What that builds is not just a tool called exposure notification, but has built relationships. So now our company has first name in the trenches experiences with health officers and with public health trade associations like ASTO and NACHO, these, you know, the alphabet soup of the really important groups that represent those health, work, health officers that we can build on for the future. And that, that coming out of the pandemic is what I'm super excited about because we, we did help, we wanna keep helping, but we need to do that with them is the point. Like we can't just build it in a vacuum. And now we've got these really strong relationships forged and this, we speak this, we're speaking similar language and. I'm excited to see about what we can do next. Yeah, it's very cool. We'll look forward to continuing progress there. Uh, can I also ask about uh, Google, and maybe as Google Cloud has a relationship with some of the larger health systems, Mayo Ascension, and recently signed um, some kind of partnership arrangement with HCA. Yes. Can you just give us a real quick thumbnail sketch of, of uh, what the purpose of those partnerships is? Oh, definitely. Yeah, we, we already had stronger partnerships with the healthcare ecosystem before. It's kind of typical, right, for tech and, and healthcare to, to be partnered up. So I, I emphasize a lot the new public health piece, but um, we've continued to progress in our work in Google Health in partnership with cloud with those partners that you mentioned. Um, the, the product and services work there is a mix of things. It's um, spanning what we call a tool we call care studio which is a tool we're developing right now with ascension that is a user interface for the electronic health record that um, makes that data intuitive and useful in the way that we've made the world's information intuitive and useful through search uh, I, I i'm overplaying it but that's the vision we're, we're not all to that place right now but where, we, where we're trying to get is something that feels familiar light airy intuitive and 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 helps with the experience of retrieving and documenting in the EHR. Um, and, and we have other partners interested in doing that with us uh, uh, beyond Ascension. We're also um, in, with cloud and um, trying to understand how we can help our partners with uh, analytics and with, with prediction models. So leveraging some of the AI and other tools to help them do some forecasting work. There's some good examples of how that's happened uh, during the pandemic, particularly around COVID, but there's other work um, that, that we've worked with, that we've done in that space. And then the, the other big bucket I should mention is work that we of, of applying AI, particularly to diagnostics and therapeutics. Uh, again, with all those partners, um, the example in the, the NHS is we've been working with them on mammography readings. So can, can uh, AI augment the reading of a, of a human radiologist to, to give a second read and accelerate the time till the woman gets her results? In the UK, the NHS requires two reads. And, and having enough radiologists to, to keep up with that causes some delays in the system. We're doing MEMA work in, in, with Northwestern uh, Medicine right now and some other places also. We're doing work um, with Mayo and therapeutics, um, uh, with radiotherapy in particular. So is there a way that we can accelerate um, the, um, the work of, of radiation therapy for head and neck cancer to, to identify what's the right field to radiate? Um, and and these, are, these and other examples in diabetic retinopathy and uh, our work in pathology in general, I think speak to not only the power of AI, but also the importance of computer vision, um, which, is, which is a tool, they're, they're related uh, tools. That just, when you take an image, right, um, can, can we help advance the diagnosis of that, of that condition and accelerate the pathway for the patient? And can we also help uh, in, in the space of treatment? So those are some examples of the ways that we're thinking of being helpful with those healthcare partners. Karen, we're gonna have to land, not because okay. I'd like to, but there is a, <laughs> you need to get back to what you're doing. But this has been an exceptionally interesting and engaging interview. 
I, w- I do have one last question, if I could, and that's the bucket list question, which is given all that you've done in your career, is there any professional kind of on your list that you have yet to do? Um, I think I'd say it more like there's a, um, there are things that I'd like to see resolved and I don't know if they'll get resolved uh, in my lifetime, but one of them is I would like um, to see that this country makes a, a real intentional and um, significant effort to resource the public health infrastructure, to give it the tools and resources it needs to protect and promote people's health every day, no matter where they live. And uh, that's the public health 3.0 work and, and some, some efforts that have grown out of it. I think we're making some progress, but I just think it's such an important part of the ecosystem. Healthcare is so important. You know, um, the, the payer space is important. Everybody, there's a lot of, of, of parts of the of actors in the sector, but public health is the only one that has the statutory responsibility and accountability to protect everyone's health who lives, learns, works, and plays in their jurisdiction. And they're an important partner to the important work that, that medicine does. And I would just like to see, I would very much um, like to continue to be able to support public health, but do it in a way that's not just projects, but see that we, we respect and, and acknowledge that we have to bring them back uh, into the family. So that's on my bucket list still. Well, my position on that is we need you back in Washington, Karen. Uh, so when you wrap up at Google, why don't you head back? We need I'm you I'm very happy where I am, but thank you for saying so. There's a lot of great talent that I'm really excited about there that I think is doing yeah. really important work. Once again, thank you so much for your time. Terrific interview. Thank you again. Thank you, Gary. It was great chatting with you. I really appreciate it. Thanks, everybody, for listening. 